Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another Knowledge is Power podcast, live podcast. And with my host, LaDonna Sherwood, and uh, where's my other host? Where is she? Oh, well, there we go. All right. I got everybody hey, hey. here. Now. All right. Okay. So, um, any uh, PSAs we need to talk about before we get to speaking to our special guest tonight is Dr. Richard Price. And we're going to talk about the, the history of the Parachute, historical Parachute District and the birth of the famous Hebrew High School. So now that I have got that out the way, let's let's go here and let's start what we always do. If we don't have any PSAs, uh, what we do? Let's we talk do, about. We do. I was yes. going to say we do have one. Of course, I'm going to be hosting the Get Out the Vote effort every Wednesday in March. We're going to be at uh, Nail Sports Bar and Grill. That's 2820 Washington Boulevard. This week, we have LaShawn Proctor, who's going to be um, on Wednesday answering your questions and discussing his platform. And I'm super excited about that. I'll send you the flyer. So near the end, maybe you can plug that in. But we have that. And then we do have um, Justice of the Peace, Naomi Doyle, that was telling people about the... Um, rent relief program so we want to make sure that we're plugging that in there are monies for both landlords and tenants to get help so that you can stay in your place a little bit longer and um knowledge is power is where you can get all that information and that's the um texas rent relief.com or you can call 1-833-9-TX-RENT that's 1-833-989-7368 and they're helping with that um and we got a very uh, important election season coming up. We want to make sure that we're plugging in early voting starts uh, April 19th, I think. Um, we want to make sure that everybody's getting out the vote. So those are our PSAs for now. And we, Knowledge is Power, is hosting in conglomeration with other podcasts on April 3rd. We're going to have all the candidates together and do a bit of a forum. Um, but yeah, Tony, put that back up. Knowledge is power. I, I am, but, but I want to I want to make sure we let them know that our guest on Tuesday night on Knowledge is Power podcast is uh, our Ward Ford candidate Chris Dirio. and on okay. first and on Thursday at eight o'clock on again on Knowledge is Power podcast we're going to have um, the incumbent well not incumbent but uh, Robin Mouton who is also is a candidate for mayor, and on Sunday of course we're going to have. Um, LaShawn well, Proctor. Um, right. So we've got a full slate for the month of um, March, but we wanted to take a break in all this politics and just relax and learn a little history because it's part of our program as well. Right. And Knowledge is Power Podcast Live is a platform to share important information by educating Southeast Texas African American communities with valuable information on health, education, finances, politics, and business. And honey, we pride ourselves on keeping our hand on the pulse of the community, making sure you know what is going on in and around the Golden Triangle. And we are super excited about our guest tonight. Dr. Price is gonna give us a historical historical perspective on the Pear Orchard, and we are super excited. I can't wait to. So also, Knowledge is Power podcast is heard over over 21 pla social media platforms. For example, Facebook, Spotify, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, Apple, iTunes, and Google Play. And if you are watching us on YouTube, hit the like button and subscribe. Tap on it and subscribe subscribe to us. Okay? Now, let's bring on our guest, uh, Dr. Richard Price, right after this 30-second intro. All right? to Knowledge is Power Podcast Live with your host, Tony Redfield, and my co-host, LaDonna Sherwood and Francis Lawkins. Knowledge is Power Podcast Live starts now. Well, hello. Well, hello, Dr. 
Good afternoon. Good evening. Oh, that's Dr. Richard Price, everybody. He's joining us tonight as we talk about the historical Pat Orchard District here in Beaumont, Texas, along with his daughter, Delisa, virtually, usually, I'm sorry, and, um, and my co-host, Donna, LaDonna Sherwood Haley and uh, Francis Larkin. So let's bring the show on to the doctor. Let us talk about, Doc, tell us, tell everybody, everybody know who you are, but kind of tell them who you are right now. Okay, I'm a product of the Pear Orchard community. Went to Hebert High School, and after graduation from there, went on to Morehouse College, and then drafted into the Army for the Korean War in 1951. Discharged in 53, uh, returned to, not returned, then my daddy suggested that I go to Prairie View in 53, graduated in 55 with the degree in mathematics, went straight to the University of Texas at Austin, uh, received a master's degree in mathematics in 58, and went to several other schools, including Iowa State, including UCLA, uh, Ended up at, at back at Ohio State where I got the PhD. Uh, joined the faculty at Lamar in 1970 and 71. Took a leave of absence in order to study religion at Yale Divinity School. Oh. And, uh, excuse me. I'm oh, sorry. I was just saying wow. <laughs> <laughs> she was just saying wow. Wow. <laughs> and... Uh, then returned to Lamar in the mathematics department and stayed there for 36 years. And a couple of other studies done at Rice University on the campus. I never had a class in what? Online <laughs> teaching. <laughs> I had to be physically present in all my studies. Separated from the law in 2006, and two months later, the principal at uh, Ozan, Mr. James Broussard, asked me to come over and to do some uh, advanced calculus classes. I did that for seven years until 2013. And since 2013, I'm just up and about, riding my bicycle every day, enjoying life, and uh, so be it until now. Wow. How yeah. many years of is that total teaching? How many years have you been teaching? We need to know. <laughs> oh, I never caught, kept count of the numbers. It's at least 50 years. I'm sure I didn't reach 56, <laughs> but over 50 years wow. in the classroom. So, so tell us a little bit about the historical parish district. Where did where did the settlement start? Where, what year? Uh, where did it start? Okay, if you're talking about school wise, uh, I can remember, and this was before my time, but <laughs> before there was a Hebert High School. My father went to Charlton Pollard on right. Grant Street. In fact, he graduated from there. His sister, younger sister, graduated from uh, Charlton Pollard the same year as my father. That was in 1916. Um, my father was not the Valen Victoria. His sister, Lula, uh, Lula Rogers, was the Valen Victorian. Dad was the salutatorium. And from there, he went to Prairie View. And from there, Prairie View sent him to Tuskegee. He studied under George Washington Carver. Wow. But he came back to Beaumont on hearing of the, of the divorce of his parents. So he came back to build a home for his mother right across the street 
from the old Hebert High School in the Pear Orchard at the corner of Sarah and Usan. And uh, in fact, the lot that's right across from the, what was the primary grade is still in the Price family name. And I was deposited on that campus. I guess it must have been around 1937 or 38. Jumped a ditch in order to get to my first grade teacher. <laughs> and at that time, you went from grade one through grade 12, all on that one campus, uh, surrounded by Sarah, Leela, Yusan, and I think the other street in the back was Paradise. <laughs> but all 12 grades on that one campus. Was it, uh, was it that wooden building? Uh, it started at that wooden, wooden building on the corner of Sarah, and I guess as you said, that back <laughs> corner? I heard, yes, that there was a wooden building uh, that had been built. Well, the land had been donated by the Blanchards and maybe the Heberts. Right. Because those are two prominent names that always come up in the black community. And uh, there was a wooden building. Uh, no one was able to tell me precisely where that building was located. And uh, because the building that I went in when I was there, that school was built in 1922. Okay, that's the red brick building. That's the red brick, brick building. building, yes. When you got to high school, you went into that building. Primary was a separate building. Uh, then third and fourth grade was a second building. And then sixth and seventh and eighth was another building. And then you went to the high school in the red brick building now tell me what year was that that was in with 35 i started there in 30 i think 30 37 or 38 okay what was it like living in i mean what was it like in the parochy because you know i'm a south thing boy <laughs> well it was a totally black community Back in those days, I never saw a, any white person in the pay artist community. Now, the first inkling that we got that there was such a people as white people, at the beginning of the school year, when we got our textbooks, they were used. They had a lot of green coloring on them, and they had names that no black youngster would recognize. That means that those textbooks had been sent from South Park High School. We got their discarded textbooks. We got their discarded uniforms. Uh, I remember one one semester we started off. I have a question. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Was the Pear Orchard considered an affluent neighborhood or was it uh, upper middle class or tell us about, tell me about the class of people that were in the Pear Orchard. Okay. A very close-knit group. It's hard to say about classes because there wasn't but one class. Mm -hmm. We were all in the same boat. We did, not okay. we did not distinguish between this class and that class. Everybody had the same Dirt streets, ditches on both sides of the street. We would clean out the ditches once or twice a year. Uh, that was done by the price board with shovels. But there was no distinction as to class. Everybody knew there was a concept of a white group of people across the railroad track on the, on the east side of the city but uh, had no direct contact with them. Did not, we attended our own black theater on Fourth Side Street, the Star Theater. 
Mm-hmm. We had our own benches, uh, Dr. Melton on both sides, the pharmacist, Dr. White on both sides. And uh, so we just did not know about white people. My daddy, I remember him taking me to town one time. It was in, a, in his one of his cars. And we went to a bank. And I saw other white people going up and making out some kind of note and giving it to the bank, a teller, and the teller would issue some money. So when we got back to the car, I said, Daddy, how come you didn't do like them other people and <laughs> got a piece of paper and get some money? That's so when you grow up, you will know why that is not so. And so he did not teach us. I'm glad he did not. He taught us what he wanted us to know, which is how to dig down, study, uh, uh, throw papers every day at paper routes, a garden on each side of the house. We produced our own vegetables. We had two cows for milk. He would milk them in the morning. And so we were self-sufficient in our location. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the reason why he never sent any of his children to a white school. Boy number one, he sent to... He went... He sent to Bishop College. Boy number two, he sent to uh, Texas College, boy number three, he sent to Morehouse College, boy number four, he sent to Morehouse College, boy, I'm boy five, he sent to Morehouse College, girl one, he sent to Spelman, girl two, he sent to Antioch College up in Ohio, girl three, he sent to Spellman, and somewhere right after that came, he had uh, become a principal of Hebert High School in 47. That's when I was in the ninth grade. And he died in 59. And when he died, that's when several of the children said, okay, I'm switching from this school to that school. And... uh, but he had us all locked into a curriculum. Yeah. A curriculum at home, a curriculum for school, a curriculum when you're not at school. <laughs> so all we knew was to go from one curriculum, one assignment to the next. Well, Dr. Hebert, I'm sorry, Dr. Price, I'm so sorry. I do want to ask questions um, about how the land was derived. Um, to kind of give me, because I'm not from Beaumont. Obviously, I'm not from a pear orchard. I heard you mention Hebert and Blanchett. And how was the land that you guys... Um, Those two families own a lot of acres of land in the pear orchard community. Yes, sir. And they donated that land to the school district on the ground that a school would be built at that time for colored youngsters. Okay. Were these so I take it they were African American. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, were these black families? Yes, yes, the black families. They were the Blanchets and the Heberts. The Blanchets and the Heberts. Mm-hmm. And right now, a lot of the a lot of the streets in and around that school, like Leela, mm-hmm. Sarah, Yusan, Bob. Uh, Bob, Marie, Sarah, all the names after the Hebert and Blanchett family to this Oh, wow. Yes. (laughs) Wow. So, Dr. Yeah, I'm sorry, I have a ton of questions. Um, So, tell me, how, what was the population in that, in that time? Oh, child. (laughs) We didn't live by population, we lived by what was our map for that day? <laughs> yeah. 
the only reason why, especially the boys, got to know as much about Beaumont as they did, because all five boys had paper routes. Mm. And as they would graduate, that paper route was passed on to the other brother or the, or the two brothers. But population-wise, I don't have the slightest idea. Now, let me ask you this, because I heard you say that all of the children that graduated basically went to college. Was that a known thing in the Bell Orchard? Did a bunch of the students graduate and go to college, or was that just affluent families? Or how did the college thing work? I hate to use the concept of affluent family because we were all in the same boat. Mm -hmm. But there were certain families like the Sprouts. Of course, they were on the north side of Beaumont, near the old mm -hmm. Sprout Hospital. And there were other families. And the, the Hebrews was a very educated family, but their parents had donated the land. Ooh, I don't know. There, I'm sure there were, but well, I don't. Doc, well, Doctor Price, why, you know, your you, your dad graduated from Hebert, and his sibling. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Charlton Pollard on Grant Street. That's what I meant. I'm sorry. Yes. And and his siblings graduated from Charlton Pollard. So you all did not settle in the South End. Oh, we never lived in the South End. Mm -hmm. Y'all always I lived in the Parchard. Always the parachute. When I was born, it was on Leela Street, going towards the from the high school, going towards the uh, the east side of the, mm -hmm. of the city, and about a block away from the railroad. Were there actually pear trees in the pear orchard? Was there what pear trees? Pear trees. Pear Child, I have heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> I so have we need to know. We are wondering why is it called the pear orchard if what were the pear trees? <laughs> now I heard that there were pear trees on the on the east side of the railroad tracks, but on the west side of the railroad tracks, we had fig trees. And so even today, there are some families that still have a history of preserving figs. figs. But my parents, everything we grew, tomatoes, bell pepper, uh, onions, okra, uh, watermelons, you name it. Well, did y'all have any fig preserves? Yes. Oh yes, my my mother <laughs> is big preserves. Uh, she would. My daddy was the main preserver. Okay. But uh, my mother and father was all. Whenever one was working on a project, they were working as one. Mm. So no pear trees on our side of the power. Remember pear tree number one. <laughs> I, I know, Doc. I, I believe you, Doc. I, I did. I, I, I'm, again, I'm, I'm a South End boy, but my parents moved in, in 59 to the pear orchard. And as of today, I have not seen a pear tree yet. <laughs> but, um, so tell me, so your dad lived in the pear orchard. And yes. he, he walked, I mean, did he walk all the way to the South End to Charlton Pollard or he just, how was that? Because that was a, it wasn't a Hebert school until 1922. No. Son, you going back? Okay, I can remember as a little toddler. No, my father had some some kind of old auto, some kind of a Ford uh, where you had to crank it. Yeah, I remember mm -hmm. sometime in the morning I would go out there and, and, and do the cranking part. But back then there was. No, Daddy. Let me use use the car to go somewhere. You didn't ask to use the car. There was no television, so you didn't ask for television. There was one phone. I never used the first time I used the phone. I made an error. I've, I've got to tell you about that. That was on Leela Street. 
and the, the Mr. T.T. T. Pollard from the yes. old Wilson Pollard. And he and my daddy were very good educators and good friends. And one morning, uh, Professor Pollard called and daddy knew it was him. And he said, Professor, answer the phone and tell him, tell him I'm gone. <laughs> So I answered the phone and said, Mr. Powell, daddy said he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first conversation on the telephone. Yeah. Okay, I think he's froze up a little bit. Uh -huh. Let's see here, we can get him back here. I'm really enjoying that. Let's see, Delisa, can you probably refresh his page, please? Hey, I was really enjoying our history because there we go. He's refreshing. There we go. Okay, we back. Yes. Got to froze up a little bit, but we're back. So we're, 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 let's back to what you were saying. Uh, just a conversation that you know yeah i can't remember what we, we, we were talking about but yeah. uh, Man, I'm, he was saying that he said daddy said he's gone <laughs> yeah 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 right that was my first conversation on the telephone mm. you see back then it was a party line yes mm -hmm. and i grew uh, up with the party line oh you know what that is yes sir i do they would call our house on Leela street and i would have to go up the street as much as three blocks because somebody wanted to speak to a neighbor and the neighbor had to come down to our house <laughs> on that party line. Yes. Sometimes daddy would get on the phone and somebody else would already be on there and daddy would say, uh, can I get on the phone? I need to make a quick call. And the other people were, you know, very respectful. Mm -hmm. Release the line because only one person could talk at a time on that line. So in the Pear Orchard, and I know it crosses the track of Washington Boulevard and goes back to maybe Carter Drive, but at that time it didn't go back to Carter Drive. It, just, it was just a little old country, dirt road with ditches on both sides, right? Ditches on every street, no pave, no gutters. Nothing. Nothing. Uh, all of this was even 4th Street. Well, going west, we knew about Zumo because that we call that Trite City. Right. Now, if there was such a thing as class, as a young lady was asking a few moments ago, yes, if you lived near Zumo, you were called Trite City. Now, that was a lower class. <laughs> that was the lowest of all the classes. Tribe City. I, you know, I got quite a few friends from uh, that lived in Tribe, Tribe City. And, and I, I knew why they called it Tribe City, because Zumo's was uh, my grandfather worked at Zumo's and they would throw the, the, the wasted meat out out to the back and they would get the wasted meat that that, that wasn't used and that's why I called a trite. Yeah and of course it, they slaughtered cattle at Zumo's. Right, right. Paper out early in the morning. Yeah I can see those cattle being brought down the chute and uh a guy with a big old mall hammer. Oh that, that, that some moment hit him across the head and then drop it into a big vat of boiling water. Oh, no. Oh, yes. And another thing on that trite city, I can remember when I came back to visit my parents before going to Korea, which means 51, 51. And uh, my father says, son, I'm going to take you and show you where we're going to build a new school. And he took me on Finette, which is what the grounds is of now Beaumont United. Uh, he said, on these grounds, we're going to build the new Hebert High School. 
And I said, Daddy, he said, what son? Fessy called the dog Fessa. I said, this is Trite City, you know. <laughs> I'm going to build a school in Trite City. And he said to me, son, in years to come, this is going to be a focal point for the black community. Wow. And another reason he wanted to build that school on that spot, he, you see, that was before Interstate 10, and, but uh, white people in the summer, they would be heading to the beach and they had to all come down the net street, right where it forks with the uh, barbecue. Mm -hmm. He said, white people are going to have to come by Finet. And if they see this school, I'm sure in years to come, they're not going to let this school go down because they're looking at it every weekend in the summer. And that's why he chose that ground for that school, new school. Yeah. So when your dad was the principal at that time of, of Hebert High School, when they, they bought that land, now, was that land there donated as well? I did not ask him. I'm thinking that the school district, because the superintendent at that time was Mr. Vincent. It was the Vincent Middle School is named after him. And uh, my brother and I, used to go and cut Mr. Benson's grass in the summer every every weekend. But my dad was considered the right hand man for Mr. Benson in the conduction of the black community. So I'm thinking that the school board approved of the purchase of that land because my dad asked him and uh, my dad, because of Mr. Vincent, could get most, whenever he wanted something, he went through Mr. Vincent. Mm -hmm. Who was the superintendent of South Who Park School District at the time. Yes. Right. So now, now when, so there wasn't a, a, what we call a the junior high school, what they call it middle schools now, but that wasn't one there at that time, was it? Mm. No, I remember the autumn because when they built the new school on Finette, autumn came over and took one wing of that new building and even high school took the east end and autumn took the west end. That's why that school was built kind of a, on a symmetrical basis. Right. Uh, you saw it to the right and you saw it to the left. Right. Wow. Francis, got another question you want to ask? Oh, my goodness. I have tons of questions. So um, you're saying what is currently now um, Beaumont United was Hebert High School, correct? Well, it was originally Hebert High School until, what, 1980. Two, I think it was when the Judge Parker uh, made a ruling because the, the superintendent was trying to keep the school separate mm -hmm. and we had to go to court. And Judge Parker said, when we told Judge Parker in court that we did not have a plan, Judge Parker called and uh, a recess in the hearing and told the school board, which included me, to go back to your places and uh, take a vote on what you want to do about Hebert High School. And we went back and at that time I was superintendent, I can't think of, Taylor. Taylor, Taylor. Mike Taylor. Mike Taylor. Mike. That's right. Mike Taylor. Okay, suggested that we close down Hebert and let all the youngsters go to Forest Park. And I stood up at that meeting and in essence, I said, white people 
If they don't like a school, they can go to Vida. They can go to Lumberton. They can go to Harden Jefferson. They can go to Silsby. I said, but black people cannot fly, which means that black people, there will always be a need for a school in the Paiarchit community. Mm -hmm. So when we took that back to Judge Parker, uh, Parker said, okay, I'm going to let the ninth and 10th grade, I'm going to combine these two schools, uh, get you a new color, and the ninth and 10th grade will go on for net, and the 11th and 12th grade will go to Forest Park. Hmm. And one year after I left the board, soon after I was elected to the board for the first time, uh, within three months, Ed Moore, who was a commissioner, mm -hmm. the Ed Moore Highway is named in his honor. Ed Moore came to me. He said, Doctor, you will only be a trustee for one term. <laughs> I said, how you know that Tom Park? <laughs> he said, because I have talked with those people out in the West End, and they don't like your philosophy. <laughs> and sure enough, at that time, all seats were open at large. Right. Call it. And uh, they put a white lady on the on, on to challenge me, and she won. And so the district went back to being all white, white. at the school. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that they did, they took the 10th grade that was at Hebert and sent them over to Forest Park, and that only left Hebert with the ninth grade. Wow. And that's how it became Westbrook. And oh, yes. wow. And that was the beginning of Westbrook. Now, was Westbrook location where it currently is today? That was yes. pretty far for people to be bused. Yes. Yes. Well, wow. before it was Westbrook, they had a school on where Amelia is, where Vincent is. Yes. Yes. Right. That's Major Drive. Vincent was the high school for whites at that time. Right. Wait a minute. Vincent was always in middle school. No, 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 no. Vincent, used, no. It, it used to be high school. It was, it was called North Forest. That's it. That's it. North Forest. Oh, North really? Forest. Yeah. Right. Yes. Now, when they decided to build Westbrook, at that time, the prevailing philosophy was, you see where Westbrook is located? Right. Build it where black people won't even know how to find it. Right. Well, you can barely find it now. <laughs> now. I have a hard time. Well, that was in 1968 when they built the school present location because they built um, John P. Odom Middle School the same way, with the same design, no windows. I never remember? understood why it was hidden like that. Why what? I never understood why it was positioned the way that that school, Vincent Middle School, why it was ducked no, off that way. No, we're talking about where Westbrook is now. Oh it, was, oh, it was once Forest Park. They built it behind the, it was nothing out there, but just nothing out there nothing. but rice fields. Rice, right. Really? Right. Wow. There was nothing there. That It was still called Forest Park at that time. Correct, Doc? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, what time did you have to wake up to be bused from? I never, I never rode a school bus in all my years because I graduated from Hebert in 49. I went okay. there in 37 and everything was on in that one, two, right. six blocks. Of well, see, Doc, she's from, she's from up there up in East Texas, Jasper, Texas. <laughs> oh, my. She don't know anything about the, the, the down here. We're not going to talk about Jasper. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would put it on the program. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, yes, they did build a forest park behind. Uh, it, it was nothing back there. I mean, matter of fact, it, it, was, it wasn't even a road back there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, but it was built so that we couldn't find it. <laughs> build it so that they cannot even find it. Yes. And sometimes now I have to go in and look to see where Westbrook is. <laughs> you, you don't, black people didn't pass by Westbrook going nowhere. That's right. <laughs> we, were, we were going to Houston. That was US 90. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. So, you know, it, it, so I'm, and I'm originally from Beaumont and I, uh, and, and I, I remember some of the trace, trace of, of the school system because again, remember I was a South End boy, but I, my parents lived in the parish, so I kind of had both. I was between back and forth between both uh, uh, settlements. So, um, where about the parish did your parents live? Where I, right, it's it's in the um, uh, right in the area where the the current Mother Mercy Church is, oh, that subdivision with Western Drive with. Uh, principal yes. Jackson lived across the street from us and all that. Right across from uh, Mother Mercy, where the Melton Y. That was the uh, TB Hospital. TB Hospital. That's right, and that yes. wasn't a, that wasn't a Mother Mercy then. There was Mother Mercy was in the parish on Broussard. Broussard is that Broussard and an olive or Broussard? Right, right, yes. Broussard, right, and it, and that's where the graveyards are. That's where the graveyards are. Right. That's where all my, my parents and my siblings are buried. Right. So I tell people a lot of times, you know, the, that Sarah Street stopped right there. Sarah the, Street stopped. The, when it crossed that track, we didn't have control. Right. <laughs> but on this, on our side of the track, that was the Blanchards and the Hebers, and the white people was not going to come and tamper with, with those settings. Right. And and Sarah Street ended at the TB Hospital, which is the the, the old Milton uh, Milton YMCA. Sarah Street ended right there. Yes, that's right. And the streets uh, guys was was seashells. I don't know if y'all remember that. Oh, wow. I remember seashells. Yes. Yeah, it was seashell streets. Shell with, streets. That's right. And dirt streets. And dirt streets. Not a pay, and I ever. Every ditch, every street had ditches. Not one mm. sidewalk. Wow, we didn't even know what a sidewalk was. <laughs> we didn't know what a sidewalk was. Right. Everybody, we're talking to Dr. Richard Price, uh, the historian of the Peoria and the famous high school of Hebert High School. And we're just talking about the history of the Peoria and the birth of Hebert High School back uh, when uh, a lot what well, back in the day, I always say that, but uh, mm -hmm. this is this is history, Beaumont history that a lot of us don't know about. And again, I, I know you shocked them, doctor, when you told them, them pair archers that uh, that your dad and siblings graduated from Charlton Pilot High School. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and they was born with I was born with blue and white blood, but you know, I'm a graduate of Hebert, with believe it or not. How about that? What year did you graduate, Hebert? In 73. Seven I graduated on Finette Road. On Finette Road. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, you know, back then we walked to school. We took the trail and you walked to school. There was no bus going there. Mm. Okay. I don't ever remember a bus. No. And I had one bus. It was called a special bus. It came from Hollywood Village. You remember that? I heard that there was a bus for Hollywood Village. In fact, my brother Othella used to drive that bus. <laughs> right. And sometimes he would go way out the uh, old Port Arthur Highway, Edward Moore, towards uh, Live Oak Cemetery because there was a nurse just before you get to Live Oak Cemetery. He had to go and pick her up every morning. On that Wasn't wasn't that back up in the Hildebrandt area, wasn't it? It was further south of Hildebrandt, but he Ooh. went to Hildebrandt also. Okay. He so, was only about three, less than a mile away from the Live Oak Cemetery. 
So, Doctor, I have a question. I know it's not crazy me asking this question. Since you went to uh, Blanchett, and I'm sorry, when you went to Hebert on Lilo Street, I have a question, and I never could figure this out. I know Hebert was a sport, had sports, and it had football, they had basketball. I remember the bond because I went to Blanchett in, in, in the third grade when I left uh, Carver. And I, I remember the bond, the, the gym. But the where gym. did, yeah, right. But where did, um, where was the football field? Okay. You see where the gym is? Right. Okay, that gym came along, I think it was, my daddy got there in 47. He put in a request for a gym. That gym must have gotten there in 48. Okay. Between the gym and the street on the west side. That's Goliath, right? Goliath. Right. That was the football field between the back of the gym, the Goliath, Leela, and Sarah. Okay, was it a stadium? Uh, it was just there a was, there was there was one set of bleachers. There was no guest bleachers. Everybody, when visitors come, they just we. Uh, he would took up one end of that bit of that stand, and the visiting team took up the other end of those same stands. Wow. I was always wondering where, where, where. I knew you guys played sports, but I didn't know where you played it. I, every time I, I would go, I drive by there before they they re, re uh, um, uh, rebuilt the school there. I would always ask where would they play ball, you know. So now I know now, yeah. But because then, I, as a young age, when I remember, I moved in um, in the Pear Orchard as a little kid uh, at in, in 1959, and there was no street on Sarah, it was a dirt road, a little muddy dirt road, and it stopped right after, after you saying in Sarah. I guess he froze up again on us. Mm -hmm. at, Delisa, would you uh, refresh his page, please? His daughter's with him. I'm enjoying this history. I love oh, me too. Yes. I love history. I have a new respect when I ride through there, trust me. And guys who are watching or listening, let me uh, let you know, I will ask some of your questions. If you have any questions, I will ask ask him uh, if we can get him back on here again, okay? So he should be here in a minute. I can't believe there was no pairs. Well, some hey, people... Hey, Tony, what do I need to do? Okay, you refresh. Tony? Yes, I'm here. I'm okay, right here. I, I, I'm looking... I'm looking at his picture. What do I do now? To refresh his page. In the top left hand corner, there should be um a circle with an arrow oh. at the end. Uh-huh. <laughs> Hit that. Uh-huh. That's okay. okay. And if not, you're gonna have to get it start over and reboot it. I mean not reboot the computer, but reboot the, the podcast. Okay, so do I X? Okay, you're entering a broadcast studio. Yes, yes. It, 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 that's, it. It. Right. that's it. I mean, I'm looking at me. We're still back where we were before. Now, he's on your laptop, correct? Yes. Okay, and people. We got a little difficult problem here, but we're right, right with you. Do, do I X out and uh, Francis, do she X out and yeah, X I would just um X out and go back to the email and just come back in. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. okay I refresh it again. Okay. Let's check the camera and mic. No, no, that has nothing to do okay, with it. Just 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 exit okay. and re-enter, okay? Yeah, just come back okay. in, click that link again I'm, and I'm, while y'all do while you trying to get back on, I'm gonna kind of answer some of these questions. I got your combo. Hey, 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 classmate. Uh, said so we. Oh, you're telling me y'all practiced there when we went to the new JP Odom. So I didn't go to that school. I I, I didn't go to JP uh, Odom School in Virginia, and the stands was gone, and we walked from the trail to the Odom School. Okay, I understand what was going on. Deborah Williams, she's also a Hebrew graduate. Let me see here. She, he has an impeccable memory. He does show does, and love talk, love hearing from him. He really can remember the things like that. He knows everybody. Tony, is that something yeah. that you're supposed to do on your end? No, 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 no. 
No, no. You are you the studio as a guest? The host can add you to the broadcast. Okay, just enter, press enter, enter the, enter the broadcast room. I mean, I don't see a link. What what am I supposed to be hitting right now? Enter. Enter. Should allow you to just hit enter. Right. Nothing. It should have his name and. Okay, I see his name. Uh huh. Oh, so, oh, oh, inner podcast. Click, click on the name. Okay. Yeah, no, click yeah. click on inner podcast. There we go. Okay. All right. Uh-huh. All right. Yeah, there we go. Back. All right. We're back, All Doctor. Right, perfect. Okay. I'm so glad you're back. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm glad you're back. And um, and we didn't lose anybody. Everybody's still listening, still watching. So let's continue going on about the history of the uh the historical parachute. District and uh, the history of uh, Hebert High School. So, Doc. Um, so, so okay, I when, when did, did, I was okay. about to say something about where we played our basketball. Okay, go ahead. Which was before the gym, gym. was built in 40, 48. Uh, there was an area right behind the principal's office, uh, between the principal's office and is that look. Is that Lavaca or Sarah? And on 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 a dirt court, there was a uh, there was a, a two 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 uh, goals put up, but for each game, uh, somebody had to go out and chalk the lines <laughs> because it was it was played on on dirt. Right. And that's mm -hmm. where we played our basketball games. Now you talk about moving up to another class <laughs> when we had to go over and play Charlton Pollard. Charlton Pollard always had a first class gym. They had a first class gym when it was on Carroll Street. And then when they closed down Carroll Street, they had a, a call it, it was called an armory. Across the street on College from the right, I remember that of the old St. James Methodist Church. Right. In fact, that armory is still in use, but back then it was used as a basketball arena, and we thought we were in another class of people when we were invited to go to to that armory. Yeah. Basketball games. Wow. And of course, we never went to a white gym because of blacks, whites did not play blacks and vice versa in those days. Mm. Francis? Yes. So um you so you only played Charlton Pollard? No, they play several schools. Other schools, so in the district, uh, yes. was it within the district or outside? Uh, within the district, no, uh, there was a there was in the Purview League. Okay. Yeah, but before it was the UIL. Okay. I right. Lost. There we go. UIL. It was uh, headquartered at Purview View A and M University. That's right. That's okay. What for all our UIL activities. Right. So with that thing, the UIL was white, and the Purview League was black. In the whole yeah. Oh, that is quite interesting. Right. They both were called UIL, but I never saw a white person at the black UIL. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh my God. So, Doc, Dr. Price, you, you, when you come back to Beaumont, in what year did you come back? I came back in 1970. In 1970. August of 70. And you went to Lamar University then. Well, yeah. before I go there, let me ask you this. I asked this question. Where yeah, since since Hebert was in the South Park Independent School District at that time, yeah. and Charlton Pilot was uh, in the Beaumont Independent School District at that time, so they had two di the school districts. At so, one time, there was five. Right. I, th th they don't know. Tell them the five. That, 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 I know about the five. Please tell me the five, so I'll be educated. I may not remember them all because I think that I heard that there one time there was a six, but there was a Goose Creek Independent School District, a French Independent School right. District, a Beaumont Independent School District, a South Park Independent School District. 
I don't know if there was a terror park independent school district. I'm vague on that. Yeah. But it was also, uh, uh, those who are watching back in, even in the 60s and 50s, there was six high schools in Beaumont. Yes. But actually seven. Wow. Right. You had South Park High School. You had Forest Park. Uh-huh. French High School, Beaumont High, Hebert, High. and Charlton Pilot. Charlton Pilot High. That's right. And they were all, back in that day, big 4A schools. Wow. Yes. So, yeah. And now we only have two high schools. So that tells you what happened. Yes. Okay. So tell me, um, Dr. Price, how has the Pear Orchard um, evolved uh, since the since it was come about? Okay. It's still a very close knit community. We can almost be self sufficient. Mm -hmm. you know? Of our own churches, we have playgrounds and uh, we have schools, uh, we have entertainment. But how it has evolved, okay, there are a few, I don't know how many, uh, black, white families that live in the Pearch community. Hmm. It's not unusual now. Of course, I must say that I don't know whether I should say it on, on, on podcast, but still, if I go in the pejorative community and see a white person, male or female, female especially, down on the inside, what is she doing here? Mm. Why is she here? Mm. That just runs through your mind because this is something you're not accustomed to. White people never had a reason back then to say, I need to go into the black community. Other than sometimes to pick up black women that was going to come and clean their kitchens and uh, do their cooking. But you never saw white people, especially the white female, in the Paiarchy community. Mm -hmm. So now some of us, if I call myself an old timer, I still have problems with it. I just don't let it surface, you know, uh, because I've learned to acclimate. Mm -hmm. In fact, like some person told me, said, once you get, a white person told me, Dr. Price, you have a degree and at that time I was I had a vote on the South Park School District. You got it made. Mm. You got it made. You got two things that white people will always respect. They will respect education and the power of the vote. Mm. That's powerful. That's awesome. Well, Dr. Mm -hmm. Hebert High School, we'll go back to Hebert High School, was a predominant black uh, high school. All um, black. All black. From, <laughs> from, from day one. From day one. <laughs> I never had any other race other than the black female or the black male as teacher and coaches at Hebert High School from grade one until you graduated. And so your dad uh, was also the principal of the high school at Hebert, and he was also the pastor of uh, one of the local churches. West in... Tabernacle Baptist Church. Right. Okay. He came into both of those positions. See, prior to 47, he was in the Beaumont school district as teacher. And in 47, 
I don't know which one asked first. I think Mr. Benson may have asked him first if he would come and take over principal of the of the Hebert High School. And maybe that same year, I still remember 47 or 48, he was asked to assume the senior pastor at West Tabernacle. At that time, West Tabernacle was in its old sanctuary, a wooden building. The sanctuary that you see there now, that was started by my father. Ooh. Yeah, but when did they when did he start building that building? He had gone to Winnie, and there was almost a copycat of that church in Winnie. And he took me to Winnie and he said, Fessa, this is the church that we're gonna build in the Pay Orchard, which became the tabernacle for what is there now as West Tabernacle. Oh wow. So how was it like uh, living, uh, being raised in the house of a pastor and a preacher? <laughs> I mean, and, and a principal. <laughs> uh, I can tell one story that would summarize all that. <laughs> so there were people, my peers, at church, they would say Reverend Price. At school, they, they Professor Price. <laughs> they had other names depending upon where was the occasion for the contact. <laughs> so one day I asked my dad, I said, Dad, these other people, they call you Reverend Price, they call you Mr. Price, they call you Professor Price. I said, what am I supposed to call you? Because I see you in all of these locations. <laughs> Daddy had a way he never answered a question, except that he asked another question. <laughs> he asked me, what am I to you? I said, you're a daddy. He said, Fessa, I may not always be principal of that high school. I may not always be pastor of that church, but I will always be your daddy. <laughs> so everywhere I saw him, I just said, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Daddy, yeah. <laughs> I have the sister that's right under me. <laughs> I've never asked her what did she call me because she went to school with him when, when he was principal at, at the, uh, Adams Elementary. Which wow. is across the street from the old G.W. Daniels Church. Right. right. Well, what about a Vidoc? At Vida Vida, yeah, when that Vida was there. And I never asked her, what did she call me? I'm pretty sure it was his daddy. That's what we all refer to him as. So daddy. it was, it was, it was uh, seven, eight of you guys, right? And you had seven, eight siblings, right? Six boys and six girls. Wow, that's a dozen. <laughs> he said he always wanted a football team and one substitute. <laughs> football team and one substitute. But he got it. All twelve and all all twelve of you uh, went on to um, to uh, college and graduate. Has uh, graduated from college and uh, ten of the twelve careers, that right. started ten of the twelve that started college graduated. Yes, the only two that did not. I had a sister. She was the third. No, she was the fourth girl, and uh, she had a medical issue, Down syndrome. And so my mother taught her at home and taught her how to knit. And she would knit Afghan, Afghans and potholders. She, she would make up the beds. Uh, she would come over to my house and make up my bed. Maybe I'm better than it was when, when I was in the military. <laughs> there was one other youngster that did, the first youngster that my mother tried to have 
outside of the home, which was in a hospital, uh, it lasted only about two or three days because back in those days, you know, when they when the mother gave birth, they put the young in the long little crib. Well, for the rest of us, we stayed in our mother's on our mother's breast until she came from. She always went to Port Arthur to have her children, and uh, whenever she came from Port Arthur, in fact, at one time, I told my brothers, "Is it true that all babies come from Port Arthur?" <laughs> How come you ask that? I, every time Mama comes from Port Arthur, she got a new baby. <laughs> and they had to teach me then, the, you know, what it takes to have a baby. I didn't know. Yeah. What it was. <laughs> <laughs> I, back then, all my brothers were older than me. I think we lost him. Okay, well, I think we lost him again. We're going to try one more time. We're we'll getting back and we're going to move. Let's see if we can get him back one more time before he frees up. Let's go. Wow, that's some, that's some history. Uh, I'm going back to the uh, comment comments and I uh, see we've got a, whoo, a lot of, whoo, quite a bit of comments. So let me try to find something. Yeah, that, uh, there we go. Yeah. 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 Same thing, and he said, "Girl, if you want something of done up a girl, you see how they're dressed every morning alike." I said, "Yes, sir." You see how your mama combed their hair? I said, "Yes, sir." He said, "If you want something from those girls, go through their mama." But the uh, girls are different, and from that point on, I was taught you treat young ladies different than you treat young men. So what type of principal was he at the high school? I know he was disciplinarian. Disciplinarian. Yes, sir. Whether he was there physically or sometimes youngsters would want to go on 4th Side Street and do some gambling, sometimes he would go and park his car on 4th <laughs> Side Street. And youngsters say, we got, we got to get out of here. <laughs> Because there's Professor Price's car, and they would they would leave his presence of that automobile. One or the other signified that he was around. Mm -hmm. Very strict, very strict on his children, very strict on his daughters. In fact, one this was in forty. The first year he was principal, I was, we were coming to school and she would have two of her girlfriends with her and they were running a little bit late. And on the main sidewalk leading up to the high school, he pulled her out of the room and he whipped her right there on the ground. From that point on, she knew not to be late for school. Mm. A strict disciplinary. Nobody ever questioned him. One brother tried it, the oldest brother, after he had been in the service, Archie Lee came back home and he did something wrong. And whenever daddy was going to do a whipping, he would call the whole family together and sit them down in the living room. The living room was all across the house. And uh, he would tell he would tell the brother, okay, get on your knees. And Archie Lee said, Daddy, I have been to the military. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk. I can't talk about that now. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Sorry get on your knees and he said dad i have been to the military and i think i'm beyond this and he said you got 24 hours to make a decision whether you're going to get on your knees if you choose not pack your clothes 
get out of this house and don't come back until you find out that I am six feet under. Daddy sure. went, actually went and talked with several people in the community, including both Ty Hebert, including Brother Joe Gidry at the barbershop. And they all said, actually, you ought to bow down to your daddy. And actually came back and said, Fessor, have you made your decision? And he said, yeah, what is it? He said, I will kneel down. Mm -hmm. He kneeled down. Daddy had a long strap. He whips a while. And then he talks a while. He opens the Bible and reads a while. And he goes back and whip again. And after about two or three rounds, he would say, ask your mama to have mercy on you. And mama would say, have mercy, please. And that's when he would stop. But the others of us, I caught less whipping than any of the others because I saw what he did to them and mm -hmm. I knew not to go down that path. Mm -hmm. Wow. Francis. Well, um, that's a rich part of history. Um, I I know that um, during those times, which I have old, older, mature uh, family members and people that um, I've talked to around that time, and that was very common, a very common practice. So, um, but it taught a lot of discipline. Mm -hmm. It eventually um, built up and made you know, those children become who they were. And in return, they had a lot of respect for themselves, a lot of respect for others in the community. And so it was just a um, a way of life and taught um, from that time. So you are who you are today because of your upbringing. And we are so gracious, so very gracious to have you um, on our show tonight and um, you know just you it's a blessing to just be in your presence yes and if, that, if I can say one other thing about yes. the whipping my third brother <clears throat> he would get a whipping and then he would go back to school and he'd say my daddy didn't whip me my daddy <laughs> didn't whip me so thenceforth whenever he wanted to whip any of the boys he would call then a, a, young, a peer of that youngster to come sit down in that living room. Now, now you go back to school and say what your daddy didn't do. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Dr. Price, I expect great this visit with you and get some, some knowledge. You know, I always tell people all the time, they ask me, why did you name your podcast Knowledge is Power Podcast? And I said, well, you know, it said in the word, he said the uh, a, a, a man will will perish with the of the lack of knowledge. Amen. Yes. So we we enjoy listening to you, and we I like to come back again and talk listen up some more one day again. But <laughs> tell us a little. Tell us one more. I can't, I, I don't want to end the show because I want to keep listening to your history. It's so good, you know. <laughs> so how did? How did, now let's say that, let me go back. How, um, I knew uh, and I grew up under um, Mrs. LaVert Blanchett. Millet. LaVert Blanchett. Right, right. So I knew some of the history of Hebert High School from her because she told me uh, where they lived on the corner of Leela and uh, yeah, Paradise. Paradise. Right. Uh, big old house. Right, big old white house. White right. house, right there on the and, corner. Right, and she, I would know some of the story because I'm again, I'm, 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 I was raised with as a bulldog, <laughs> you know, from Charlton Pilot. so I know those stories. And again, we're gonna have a historian on here, historian on here to tell us about the the South End and Charlton Pilot as as uh, also. But how back in those days, everybody had to know everyone. Uh, when was the migration of the folks from Louisiana sh started migrating to the Pear Orchard? Wow. 
this is getting almost personal because my mother was born in Crowley, Louisiana. That was in 1905, 1905, 1906. But there was a rider what do they call him? The Red Rider, the some kind of rider. And he went around terrorizing black families. On my mother's side, her mother was murdered by this, whatever they call this rider. And the way I understand it, it was a week later before they went out into the country where they live and discovered their bodies. It was my mother's mother and one or two of her siblings. And so at that time, my mother's grandmother made the decision that they were going to leave Crowley mm. they came to Port Arthur. And they sell down at the corner of Roosevelt, maybe in Ninth Street. Don't quote me on that. I think it's Roosevelt and Ninth Street in Port Arthur. And that was all right around the old Lincoln High School. And my mother was raised by her auntie at 845 West 11th Street, which since then, the school district has bought up that property and built a gymnasium on top of it. But all of my, on the Barker side of the family, that's my mother was a Barker before she became a Price. They all came into Fort Arthur from, from Crowley, Louisiana. Mm. And uh, my brother Othello, on one occasion told me that mama asked him to take him to Crowley. And he drove her to Crowley and went into a certain neighborhood. And my mother was able to say, I think I remember that tree. I think I can remember that tree. But she said, Othello, take me back home. So nobody else ever took us to Crowley and said anything about the Barker family while they were in Crowley. But do you know about the migration of the Louisianans into Carolina? So I, at that time, yeah, there were several other there were several other families that migrated from Crowley and settled in Port Arthur. Most of them went to Port Arthur. It may have been because Port Arthur is closer to the waterways and Crowley was close to some waterways. So they were accustomed to being around water. Wow. Because I asked that question because I'm, quite a few people that lives in, the, quite a few families that lives in the Pear Orchard are are from Louisiana, South Southern Louisiana, Crowley, Rain, uh, uh, Appaloosas, all those little places there. Yeah, right. And I just thought maybe that was they just that was their settlement. I mean, I know they all went to Port Arthur first, and then they, they settled. Port Arthur. Yeah, right, they went to Port Arthur first, and then come to settle in the Pear Orchard. My mother went to Port Arthur. Her grand, her auntie that raised her, belonged to Sixth Street Baptist Church the old Sixth Street Baptist Church. And um, my mother became the pianist. My mother always played a piano. And uh, Joe Gidry had gone to Sixth Street Baptist Church for some kind of something and came back and told my daddy. He said, Archie, I saw a young lady at Sixth Street Baptist Church and you ought to, you ought to meet her. And sure enough, he went and visited that church, and that's where he met my mother. And 12 children later, you know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> but early on in their courtship, uh, he told me when he would go to Port Arthur to visit uh, Cleona, my mother, uh, 
Her auntie sat in the middle. She sat on one side. My daddy sat on the other side. Now y'all talk. <laughs> and when they finished, okay, Archie, it's time for you to go on back to Beaumont. And uh, she wanted to go. She wanted to go to college. She graduated number one from Lincoln High School, right across the street from the. And on the other end of the block was her principal. I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, Professor Sampson. Was her principal. I read the history on him when we studied Lincoln. Wow, I gotta ask that. I gotta ask that one more thing. And that's just how old is he? Because he can name the addresses for, mm -hmm. way, for way back in 1935. And that, that's I know, I can't, wait, I can't name my address from last year. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I'm, scared to, I'm scared to ask him. He might know the phone number. Uh, <laughs> this old phone number. Uh, he said, I promise you I will take care of, of Cleona. And yes, he did. His wife was his number one priority, even above his children. Mm -hmm. Well, Doc, I have to ask this question because I would just say when you froze up a minute, we had paused for a minute, that uh, you knew the addresses, and you knew the streets, and you knew, and I'm saying scared to ask you your old phone number. You might tell me what your phone number was on Leela Street. So. On the party line. <laughs> on the party line. The party line. You remember I only used that phone one time. <laughs> oh, oh. When Daddy said, tell Professor Pilot I'm not home. Professor Pilot, Daddy said, I'm not home. <laughs> that was the only time I used that phone. <laughs> so, so tell me. Only thing, no, we, we ignored it. Yes. Nobody was calling for him, for any of his children. Right. So I'm gonna ask you two questions now. Who was the oldest and who was the smartest out of all the boys? Wow. Okay. <laughs> Archie Lee was the oldest. Okay. Archie Lee was the best set of brains the Price family ever produced. Mm. Archie Lee. I the heard that. I heard that. Archie Lee would read, photograph it. He could recall it years and years later. Archie Lee read intensively every day. He read everything. Mm. Even some of his students at Hebrew school said he was a very avid reader. Archie Lee by far was the best set of brains in the Price family. Othello was the wisest. Othello always had a theorem, always had a reason, had a famous statement, for every deed under the sun, there is a reason or there is none. If there be one, go and find it. Otherwise, uh -huh. never mind it. That was Archie Lee. No, Othello. Othello. That was Othello. AJ had a good set of brains. At the one that y'all call Al. Right. Al had AJ. Al was always right ahead of me. He was a year and eight months older than me. And Al always gave me my directions. Even at Morehouse, Al made up, I call him AJ. Everybody else called him Al. Uh, even at Morehouse, AJ made up my schedule every every semester told me what classes to take. Uh, there was one named C.W., we called him Cop. Cop, I could borrow his suits on Sunday if I wanted to go to church. And Cop would always give me a, sometime a quarter, sometime a half dollar. I don't ever remember him giving me a dollar, but if I wanted to go somewhere, Cop would provide me with the resources and I consider myself, I had more formal education than any of my other brothers or sisters. Maybe it took longer for me to learn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> always had to have that teacher in the classroom. Mm -hmm. But to this day, I spend most of my evenings in my office on the other end of the house with my computer. If you went there now, you might see, you're going to see several calculus books on the desk, on the floor. They all open. You're going to see the Bible open. If I'm reading the prophet, you're going to see where I left off reading. I spend all of, most of my time in the books, paper and pencil close by. Some of the calculations I will ask a, a, a software package that I use if I don't feel like doing it by hand. I'll guide the software package to go slow because I want to see what I'm writing. Mm -hmm. And that's every night. So when people say the pandemic has kept them in, I'm already in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already in. Right. I go out to ride my bicycle every evening. I didn't ride the day because of this podcast, but uh, I still love my bicycle riding throughout the. So, Doc, tell me this: What do you think of the Pear Orchard now? Uh, you think we, it's an opportunity for it to 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 grow, um, uh, to have a better opportunity in 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 that part of the district. It can grow for the same reason that I think it's a very homogeneous group of people. We all tend to know everybody else. And whenever something touches one family, yeah, there's somebody else that knows immediately, you know, about what's going on. So it's very homogeneous. It's not like sometimes you go into an area and you got a very diversified, and so you get all kind of conflicting ideas about what should and what should not be done. But in the Patriot community, that homogeneity is the one thing that has kept us together. And I think it always will. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Richard Price. Uh, Francis, you got any last words? Play any you want to ask, Dr. Price? Absolutely. Uh, well, nothing I need to ask, just some comments. Um, again, I want to thank you for joining us. I love history and I love learning new things. And um, I, we're just so blessed to have you, especially with me being not a actual, um, I didn't grow up here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and but I do love Beaumont and mm -hmm. I hear yes. Yes, sir. Jasper. Okay. Yes, sir. And I hear great thing about the Pear Orchard, but I am blessed to know the the richness and the history that it derives. So, and your dad, uh, Doctor Price, who started the, 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 the richness and tradition of Hebert High School. He started. Okay, I can remember early on his telling me. Even before, even at the old high school, oftentimes he was not satisfied with the quality of the teachers in the classroom. And he said, I am going to build a program that will be worthy of emulation, not only in Beaumont, but across this country. And so names like Brother Minix, uh, Brother Sanders, Brother Osborne, uh, Levert Blanchett, Brother Sanders. He went out and recruited uh, Brother Jackson. He brought Brother Jackson in from some town near Yoakum on the way to San Antonio. And he told Brother Jackson early on, one day when I am not principal of Hebert High School, you are supposed to be prepared to step in my shoes. And so that's why Professor Jackson was brought here as a coach, but he ended up as principal once my father passed. Wow. 
I did not know that, but I knew that by living across the street from Mr. Uh, Mr. Jackson, I knew he became the principal in 1959. From, right. And he was the head coach of the football team at that time before that. Yes. He was my, when he was first brought there, he, along with Professor Thomas, Professor Thomas uh, succeeded my daddy when my daddy left Adam to come to Hebert. Professor Thomas took his place as principal of Adams School. But Professor Thomas and Professor Jackson were my early coaches, along with Professor, with uh, Coach Mayfield. Mm -hmm. Coach Mayfield. Coach Mayfield. Wow. I've, I've learned a lot here this evening as well. And I'm sure my listeners <laughs> and, uh, have learned a lot as well. Absolutely. Yes. One thing about Professor May Coach Mayfield, a very stern disciplinarian. He kept a board, not a strap. He kept a board. And I will always remember the greatest whipping I never got. <laughs> was because this was the year we were going to play our football game with Charlton in Greeny Stadium. And we were playing Charlton Pilot, and Charlton Pilot was leading at halftime. They were leading not by three or four points. They were leading. And so when we went back to the dressing room, uh, Professor Mayfield got, Coach Mayfield got his board and started paddling, started paddling. When he got to me, one of the coaches said, Coach, it's time to be, get back out on the field. And he said, okay, boy, I'm going to get you later. <laughs> he never got around to that, and I never reminded him. <laughs> so, I mean, he would had a had a, a you know, even the student academic wise, it was a very uh, uh, they achieved a lot, and it has a tradition back in the day. The, uh, what, what is the what is it's called? Uh, uh, I can't think what I want. To <laughs> As Hebrew is the best, I can't think of it. I wish someone to put a comment. Dr. Price is making you look bad now. Yeah, telling you do. I'm telling you. <laughs> well, it, it may, it may be some of that came out of that statement <laughs> Mr. Jackson put out. If it something, if it's got to be done by Hebrew, it's got to be the, be best. the best. That's it. That's it. That's, that's what I. That's what I was looking for. Yes. <laughs> Hey, you know, I, I was looking, I'm looking at all the comments on everybody's coming, <laughs> and I did not, I learned something again tonight. I did not learn until tonight that the, the Jackson rollout uh, that the, the the drill team would do every game it was called the Jackson rollout, and it was named after Principal uh, Jackson. Yes, and the young lady that instituted that, she, Lottie B. Thomas. Right. Lottie B graduated with me. Uh, her best friend, Bessie Mae Porter, was number one. I was number two. Lottie B was number three. And so Lottie B st started that drill team, and the rest of that is history. Absolutely. I mean, even Pam has said, come on, because I know you can remember that. When Heba does, it must be the best. Must You're be. right. I can't, you know, I went to nine schools, so I can't remember all the mottos. <laughs> that was Lottie B. Yes, ma'am. And also, um, Aunt Louise uh, was there with, with you as well, right? Who is Aunt Louise? Aunt Louise. Mm. She was the teacher, but she was our big, that was the biggest cheerleaders. Oh, I remember Sister Taylor. That's right. Uh, Louise Taylor. Louise Taylor. Yes. Ooh, she was a taskmaster. Yes. <laughs> she was a taskmaster. Right. I never had her in the classroom, but yeah, you knew of her. Uh, Sister Taylor, uh, Alzina Barker. Before she married and became a Granger. Oh, I had her in the third grade. I had to wear a bow tie every day. That's that's Miss Granger. <laughs> Miss Granger, I had her in the what second grade, and 
One interesting story about her, this was in, it must have been in November of some year, but she said she was going to give a test, a math test. And she said, if you don't make 70, you're going into the coat, coat room. Now that means something else. <laughs> so she gave the test on the next day, she started calling the name. I remember C.C. Scott come on to the coat room and you heard the wailing and the so forth. Okay, Pluto, Angel, come on in the cloakroom. <laughs> and finally she said, Richard Price, come in the cloakroom. Miss, Miss, Miss Barker, I made 80. The cutoff was 70. You're supposed to make 90. <laughs> <laughs> so I go in the cloakroom and boy, I start getting jittery. And that's why I know it was wintertime, she said, Pull down your pants. I said, my mama told me not to pull down my pants in front of ladies. <laughs> Ugly look. Now she was already, she was not a Marilyn Monroe to look at. Right, 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 right. <laughs> pull those pants down. I said, okay, I got on my LCDs underneath. So I said, I'm protected. I pulled my <laughs> pants down and then it was the LCDs. And you had 12 buttons across the back when you wanted to do a number two. <laughs> Unbutton those buttons. I said, oh, my God. And I said again, Mama told you, boy, pull the, unbutton those buttons. And when she got that bear, whatever was there, that's what she whipped. And <laughs> I said, right then, don't ever make under 90 because the dog going to whip you. <laughs> yes. So ninety was my yeah yeah right I I was a I was a student of Mrs. Barker Granger and uh, we had to the boys had to wear a bow tie or a tie to school in her class and the girls had to wear a ribbon or a ribbon. Uh, on a in their hair yes right and one day I was on my way walking walking to school I, I, I remember I'm a South End boy so I only went to the Blanchard in my third grade year just for quick as a hurt and um, I got halfway to the school and realized I did not have my bow tie on <laughs> I turned around and I cried and ran all the way home <laughs> I wasn't going to go to school without that tie because I knew I had to go to that closet <laughs> Big disciplinarians. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. She sure were. Never had to call a policeman to the campus between my father and certain people on that campus. Didn't have discipline problems. Didn't have disrespect problems. And that's a shame. And you think that we would need that right now with the students that we have today. It wouldn't even work. It wouldn't work. <clears throat> it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. Well, Dr. Price, we've held you up enough. I thank you so much for accepting my invitation and uh, with my co-hosts, uh, LaDonna Sherwood and uh, Francis Larkin. I know, Francis, you enjoyed that. Oh, I thoroughly enjoyed this evening. And thank Dr., you. I enjoyed it. This is, I mean, I, I was thinking during... Uh, uh, last month, I said, I need to do another type of show, and I got to do something. I, and, and and it had come up to me, it just flashed in my it just flashed in my spirit. I said, hey, I got to know about the history of the parachute. I didn't want a history of a Hebrew high school. Um, and, uh, and I was trying to find um, um, a um, someone to tell me about it who's still living. Because all our, all your classmates, they're all, almost gone now. <laughs> almost gone. Yes. So I, I have one still in Beaumont. I just found out who she was about two weeks ago. Mm. Wow. So it's just two in your class. You're in the class of 1942. 49. 49. Now, you did remember the, the, the race route in 1942 here. 42, right? 43. Right, 42 and 43. Yes. That's another story. That's another story. So, Doc, we're going to come back to that one day, and we're signing you up, and I want you to tell us about the history of the Boma. I want to talk about the difference between Charlton Pollard and Hebert, the, the two, uh, the two uh, territories, and God, I just can't 
thank you enough for joining us and and um, giving us this rich history of uh, the and the Hebert High School and your family because your family was a permanent family in our um, in our communities and. Um, um, I'm glad I was able to give you some prop while you're still here with us. Thank so you. you have any, you have anything you want to share with us before we close out? No, my pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome, Francis. Yes. Uh, again, thanks so much for being so gracious to join us this evening. I was blessed by the show, so thank you. And and your niece Pam said hello. Okay. Oh, hi Pam. No, I'm talking Dr. Price. Oh, okay. Dr. Price, your, your niece Othella's uh, daughter said hi. Thank you. Okay. And I, Lisa, hope, I hope to meet you all personally someday. Sure will. I will stop by and visit with you. Hey, Delisa, thank you for your engineer experts. <laughs> <laughs> you did great. Thank you. You did great. Thank you, everybody. And we thank you again for watching and listening to Knowledge is Power Podcast Live. We are on all the social media. Just look us up at searches at Knowledge is Power Podcast Live. Also, on Tuesday, we have the Ward 4 candidate, Chris Durio, going to be joining us. And on Thursday, we will have a mayor candidate, uh, Robin Mouton, will be with us on Thursday. So we'll see you again on Knowledge is Power Podcast Live. And I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Knowledge is Power Podcast Live. Be sure to like and subscribe to all Knowledge is Power social media pages.